Hey guys, how you all doing today? Welcome to another episode of Hockey on the Spot with Brandon Barenfeld. I'm Brandon Barenfeld. Thank you all for joining me today. This is episode 159 of Hockey on the Spot. And for t today, we're going to continue with the NHL's 30 teams in 30 days. We're almost done. Just four teams to go. <coughs> and for today's episode, we're going to talk about the Arizona Coyotes. That's right. You heard me. The Arizona Coyotes. They are no longer the Phoenix Coyotes. They are now the Arizona Coyotes. And their arena is no longer called Jobbing.com Arena. It is now known as the Gila River Arena. Um, that will be the name of the arena when they take the ice for their season opener against the Winnipeg Jets on October 9th. So the name changes are now official, and all the rumors and speculation of them moving out of Arizona or Phoenix, wherever they, wherever you want to consider it, are finally going to be put to bed this season. We can finally put those rumors of them leaving Arizona to rest. They were kind of put to rest last season, but now this season with the name changes ha finally occurring, it can officially be put to rest this year. They're still the same team, just a, just now representing the whole entire state of Arizona rather than just the city of Phoenix. So with that being said, let's talk about the Arizona Coyotes. Let's analyze their their previous their 2013-2014 season as well as preview their 2014-2015 season. Let's go. So, <clears throat> last year for the Arizona Coyotes, <coughs> things started off great. They got off to a great start, <coughs> and at one point, they looked like they were going to go to the playoffs. They were, I think they were undefeated for the month of October, or nearly undefeated for the month of October. They were great in the first month of the year. They were just... They, they were just a team that could not be beat. They played a hard style. Mike Smith looked like looked, looked like he was back in form. Yes, so they recorded a franchise. Uh, they tied a franchise record nine wins in October to begin the year. Um, but unfortunately, after that great first month, the team that was up, that took the ice the rest of the way did not resemble the team that began the season. Um, um, they started to play it more, un in more inconsistently, and for the second straight year, they, they came up just short. For the second straight year, they looked like they were going to be a playoff team, and for the second straight year, they did absolutely horrible in the final stretch of the season. They did absolutely terrible in their last ten games. Um, and in their final eight games, they all, they lost seven out of their last eight games to finish the season. I mean, four or, or five of those games came in the form of overtime or a shootout, but losing out on those extra points really hurt them down the stretch, and the Dallas Stars caught up to the Coyotes and clinched the final playoff spot, not just in the Western Conference, but in, in the entire league. The, they were, that eighth and final spot in the West was the only spot that wasn't clinched um, at one point in the season because it was between the Coyotes and the Stars, and ultimately the Stars would get it. Um, the Coyotes had a huge lead in, the point, in points to take the eighth and final spot in the West, but ultimately... <coughs> Um, the Dallas Stars finished two points ahead of the then Phoenix Coyotes. <laughs> Remember, they were the Phoenix Coyotes last season. And once again, their playoff hopes came up just short. So, it was kind of a rough year for the Yotes last year. A rough way to finish out for the second straight year. And, you know... And unfortunately for the Yotes, a lot of negatives came out of that season. But their their overall play as a team did not resemble what they look how well they were playing at the beginning of the year. They were they were nineteenth in the league in team plus minus at a minus thirteen. However, they were however the one good thing to take out of that though is that they were a plus seven at home, which means they were a good home team. They were able to score pretty good at home. 
It was on the road that they struggled. They were a plus 7 at home, but they were a minus 20 on the road. Um, I believe they were a much better home team last season. Uh, <coughs> yeah, they were a much better home team, and actually, it pretty much was their road record that killed them de de in this season, because they were one of the better home teams in the Western Conference, 22-14-5 at, at the then Jobbing.com Arena, but 15, 16, and 10 away from their away from the desert. So they were one game under 500. It was their road record that ended their that pretty much destroyed their season. Um, but they were, but yeah, it was definitely a rough year for the team. Um, and as far as their, and honestly, for the for a franchise that was known for playing a more of a defensive type style, they really didn't have much of an identity last season because last season, not only did they struggle offensively, but they struggled defensively as well. <coughs> they were 20th in the league with a 2.56 goals for percentage. And for go as far as goals against was concerned, they were... 18, they weren't much better. They were 18th in the league at 2.73%. So, though they were technically better defensively, it wasn't by much. The per it, their percentage defensively wasn't that much higher than their percentage offensively. It was still in the bottom 15 in the league, and it still wasn't great. <coughs> so, um, and last season, in probably the most unfamiliar ground of all for the Yotes last year, was the fact that they were 26th in the league on the penalty kill at an even 79%. <coughs> the, usually this is a team that's one of the better penalty killing teams, if not the best penalty killing team in the league. Last year their penalty killing was awful. But in turn, this probably was the big surprise of all. <coughs> their power play, which is no, usually known for not being that good, was actually one of the best power plays in the league. The power play was pretty much where they did most of their damage last year. Fourth, fourth in the league on the power play at 19.9%. Only the Pittsburgh Penguins, Washington Capitals, and Boston Bruins in that order had a better power play than the Yotes. And of all the... And for the Yotes, they had the best power play in the Western Conference, and they didn't even make the playoffs. So that says a lot about how well their team was on the power play last year. And the other good news about their team last year is that they weren't very, they weren't, they didn't, they weren't one of the more penalized teams in the league. They were eighth in the league, tied for seventh with the Nashville Predators at 9.9% in as far as penalty minutes per game average penalty minutes per game so they were one of the least penalized teams in the league they were in the top they were one of the top 10 cleanest team cleanest teams in the league last year but their power play was the big upside of their team last year and I prop and it was their power play that propelled them to come close to making the playoffs <coughs> but eventually every other area including their penalty kill which again was 26th in the league, pretty much held them down and held them back. <coughs> so um, that was pretty much what the, how their 2013-14 season went um, as far as the team effort goes. As far as a, the, the play individual, from an individual standpoint, unfortunately for the Yotes, they, they had more, way more minus players than plus players. <coughs> Keith Yandel was their worst player plus minus wise. It was actually a very interesting season for Keith Yandel. He played all 82 games. He only had 63 penalty minutes and he had 241 shots on goal. <coughs> but here's where it gets interesting. He was their best. He led the team in points last year with 53. He had 8 goals and 45 assists. He led their team in assists last year. He, yeah, he led their team in assists and points last year. 45 assists, 53 points, only 8 goals, but he's more of a passing <laughs> offensive defenseman than a goal scorer. However, he was a minus 23, which was the worst on the team, which was the worst plus minus on the team, 
But that also tells you that he had the most ice time of any player on the team last year. So, very rare when a defenseman leads your team in point scoring. And it tells you how bad offensively they were, were as a team. They only had three 20-goal scores last year. And one of them, Radim Verbata, isn't even on the team anymore. He had 20 goals. Shane Doan had 23, and Antoine Vermette had 24. Antoine Vermette was their leading goal scorer last year. <coughs> but but Ryan Verbata also tied with Mikhail Bodker to lead their forwards to 51 points. Bodker had 19 goals and 32 assists. Verbata had 20 goals and 31 assists. So, <coughs> um... They lose a big chunk of offense with Radim Verbata and Mike Ribeiro as well. They also lost Mike Ribeiro this offseason, and we're going to talk more about that in a second. Um, so, going into the offseason um, now, after making the playoffs for three straight years from 2009 to 2012 and, well, 2010 to 2012, really, um, and in their most recent playoff appearance in 2012, not only winning the Pacific Division, but going all the way to the Western Conference Finals, their best run in franchise history, and losing out and bowing out in five games to the Los Angeles Kings, the eventual Stanley Cup champions from that year. You know, since then they haven't made the playoffs. They did not make it in the lockout short year, and they didn't make it this year. Um, they did not make it this year. Overall, <coughs> their record at the end of the season, 37, <coughs> 30, and 15, which is good enough for 89 points, fourth in the Pacific Division, but ninth in the Western Conference. They did not make the playoffs because five Central Division teams made the playoffs last year. Two... Central Division teams clinch the wild card spots. The Minnesota Wild were the first wild card, and the Dallas Stars were the eighth, were the second wild card. So, for the Coyotes, they knew there were changes that were going to be made to their team. They they knew that changes were going to be made. Um, I mentioned the losses of Radim Verbata and Mike Ribeiro. Mike Ribeiro actually had three years remaining on his contract. He had signed a four-year deal with the Yotes, but he was bought out at the draft by the Coyotes via, com via regular buyout, actually. They did not buy him out via compliance buyout. They used a regular buyout on Mike Rivera, which means the remaining years of his contract will go against their salary cap a little bit, but they bought him out because of off supposedly because of off-ice issues, because, and those off-ice is issues supposedly included complaining about his living situation in, Ari in the state of Arizona, and also some drug problems um, off the ice. That's the supposed belief, but ultimately the Coyotes wanted nothing to do with that, and for Mike Ribeiro, he went on to sign a one-year deal with the Nashville Predators. So he is now a member of the he is now part of a Nashville Predators group with a deep center core this year and a group of centers who will all battle for the number one center spot. They also lost right winger Radim Verbato, who had been with the team for a sec he who had been with the team for his second stint since the 2009-2010 season. He went on to sign a three year deal with the Vancouver Canucks. Um, and he'll, where he'll hopefully help out the Sedin twins and hopefully help them get their careers back in shape. <coughs> other than those two losses, <coughs> um, other losses included the loss of left winger Tim Kennedy, who played a few games for them last year. He signed with the Washington Capitals. Um, and they also lost goaltender Thomas Grice. That was actually a pretty big... That's actually a bigger loss than, it's, than it looks like for the Coyotes because Thomas Grice is an above-average backup goaltender. And last year, the German-born goaltender was considerably one of the best, if not the best, backup goaltender 
in the league. So that is a big loss for the Coyotes <coughs> to lose Thomas Grice. Um, he really helped out their team last year when Mike Smith wasn't playing. There were times when Mike Smith got hurt as well. So losing him, that's kind of a, that's kind of a low blow for the Coyotes. A lower blow than it sounds, even though it is a backup goaltender. Again, he was one of the better backup goaltenders in the league last year, and he went on, to, and he went on to sign a deal with the Pittsburgh Penguins. So he goes and joins Mark Andre Fleury out in Pittsburgh to solidify their goaltending. Other than that, all, all the other losses that of players. Of all their other players were intentional. I mentioned Tim Kennedy already. He went to the Washington Capitals. But other players like left winger Paul Bissonnette, right winger Brandon Yip, center Jeff, Hal Jeff Halpern, and veteran defenseman Derek Morris, they're all still unrestricted free agents. None of those four players have signed with anybody yet, but none of those four players will be back with the Coyotes this season. Uh, Derek Morris, uh, last year, was kind of a struggle for him, so they let him go. Um, so, so those players are still on the board, but they will not be back with the Coyotes this season. Um, as far as additions are concerned, the, the Coyotes this offseason really did not go too crazy. They, they didn't go too crazy this offseason. Um, they added a little bit of goaltending depth by signing two goaltenders who could both battle for backup jobs, but one will probably get it over the other. What they, and the two, the two goaltenders include Mike McKenna coming over from the Columbus Blue Jackets. He played a few games last year. And Devin Dupnik, who... Last year split the season between the Edmonton Oilers and the Nashville Predators. He was even worse when he played with the Nashville Predators. He had a bad year last year with the Oilers. He was even worse with the Predators. He only played two games for the Predators, but then by the end of the year was ultimately dealt to the Montreal Canadiens, where he was not given a chance at all. He was instantly buried with the in the minors to play for the Hamilton Bulldogs of the American Hockey League. So he, his most recent so he's technically coming over from the Montreal Canadiens affiliate, the Hamilton Bulldogs. It's believed that Devin Dupnik is probably going to be the backup and Mike McKenna will battle for the starting job down in Portland this year. But they also have Mark Vishington down there. Um who could also battle for a backup job um, this year. And if he doesn't get the backup job, he would actually probably be the starter for the Portland Pirates of the American Hockey League. <coughs> but Devin Dubnik... So Mike McKenna really just there to add more depth and goal. Devin Dubnik's really the addition for, to, for their backup goal te for tending. Um, he is expected to be the f legitimate backup goaltender this year. And Devin Dubnik, he had some okay years with the Edmonton Oilers, but he never panned out to become the goaltender that everyone expected him to be. He was a former 14th overall pick by the Edmonton Oilers from the 2004 NHL entry draft, and he's now 28 years of age. He's a huge goaltender, too, hulking at 6'6", six six, 210 pounds, so more of a stand-up goaltender, but he never found his consistency last year in the season combined with the Edmonton Oilers and Nashville Predators. He played 34 games, 32 of them with the Oilers, 11 wins, all 11 wins coming with the Oilers, and 18 losses, 17 losses with the Oilers, one loss with the Predators, three overtime losses, two with the Oilers, one with the Predators, and two shutouts, both of them coming with the Oilers. <coughs> with the Oilers, he had an eight, uh, 336 goals against, against average, <coughs> and 894 save percentage. Both of those statistics through two games with the Predators were even worse. A 435 goals against average, and 850 save percentage. He gave up five and four goals in games, respectively. 
those are some rather ugly numbers. Um, he he had some rather ugly numbers all of last year, and after his last shutout through the final five games that he would play overall, he gave up at least three goals in every single game. Only one of those games resulted in a win. So, so bad year for Devin Dubnik last year. He had some rather ugly numbers last year. He now comes to the Coyotes to hopefully get a brand, have a brand new start and hopefully prove himself. He probably will never turn out to be a starting goaltender ever like he was supposed to be. But at the very least, he could be one of the one of the better backup goaltenders in the league this year. <coughs> but this is the third different backup goaltender to Mike Smith in his three seasons with the Coyotes. When he first arrived to the desert, he had Jason LaBarbera as his backup goaltender. Um, so... His second year, obviously, he had Thomas Grice, and he was a great backup goaltender. <coughs> now they have Devin Dubnik, so rather interesting situation. Um, they also brought in centerman Joe Vitale coming over from the Pittsburgh Penguins to add some depth and add a little more edge to their fourth line. They needed a, they wanted a more physical fourth liner. Or from Jeff Halpern. They really didn't have an overly physical team last year. <coughs> um, and Joe Vitale is kind of an upgrade from Paul Bissonnette, if you ask me. Yes, he was part of one of the worst, if not the worst, fourth lines in the league last year <coughs> with the Pittsburgh Penguins, joining Tanner Glass, who is now at the New York Rangers, <coughs> and Craig Adams. But he plays with an edge, um, he, and he also plays... <coughs> He plays with an edge without overdoing it and taking too many penalties, but he can also play a solid two-way game. He's more, he was a minus player last year, but he was only a minus one. He was really good defensively in the playoffs, though. <coughs> last year through the regular season, through 53 games, only one goal, 13 assists, and 14 points, 29 penalty minutes, and 42 shots on goal. <coughs> In the playoffs, through 13 games, not a single point, but he was an even. He was even in the plus-minus rating, whereas in the during the regular season, <coughs> he was a minus one. Only four penalty minutes and 13 shots on goal, so he averaged one shot on goal per game. But he's a player who can who can contribute in little ways. <coughs> I actually like this signing <coughs> by the Coyotes. He is gonna be. He just turned 29. <coughs> He's a native of St. Louis, Missouri, um, but he'll help them out. He'll he'll help them out defensively, and he just adds more center depth to a very weak center group. Um, and then the other two players that the Coyotes got both came in the form of a trade, and and a, a trade that was made with the Tampa Bay Lightning. In that trade, they acquired forwards B.J. Crombie and. And Sam Gagne. Sam Gagne is the big addition for the Coyotes this season. Sam Gagne, obviously last year, played for the Edmonton Oilers. Um, and for the Oilers last year, it was a it was a major setback year. He was expected to very much improve on his 2012-13 lockout short year, in which he had a great season. Last year for the Oilers, though, he regressed. <coughs> Through 67 games played, <coughs> ten, only 10 goals, which is a career low for him, 27 assists, and 37 points, which is also a career low. He was a career low, minus 29. He was one of their worst plus-minus players. <coughs> uh, he may have even been their worst plus-minus player. <coughs> um, 41 penalty minutes, which... And 143 shots on goal. So last year, uh, he even though he did generate a lot of shots, it, and wasn't was generally a clean player, offensively and defensively, he was absolutely terrible. The Oilers knew they could not keep him anymore. They needed a better second line center, which is why they went on to select Leon Dreisaitl in the first round, and they expect that he. 
either he or Anton Lander or Mark Arcabello will be their second line center this year, which which gave them the flexibility to trade Sam Gagne. So Sam Gagne was originally dealt by the Edmonton Oilers to the Tampa Bay Lightning in order to acquire forward Teddy Pers in exchange for forward Teddy Purcell, but then the Lightning. Only it was discovered that the Lightning only got him to trade him, so they traded both him and B.J. Crombie to the Coyotes for a mere sixth round draft pick. So a big steal for the Phoenix Coyote or the Arizona Coyotes, um, only having to give up a sixth round pick to acquire both of those players. A, a trade that was very poorly handled by the Tampa Bay Lightning, which is something that the Coyotes should be very fortunate and happy about. Because with B.J. Crombie, whether he's in the main roster or not, whether he's in the main roster or posing as a 13th or 14th forward, he adds depth to their organization. And the Colorado-born Canadian is a good, you know, is generally a phys very good physical player. He plays with an edge. Last year, through 55 games played, 3 goals, 7 assists, 10 points. <coughs> A minus two rating while putting up 79 penalty minutes and 60 shots on goal. So, again, he's not an offensive player, and he's not a very good defensive player either. He just plays with an edge. He plays hard. He brings the, net to the, he brings the puck to the net. Um, he four checks. He can skate well. I actually like the, the fact that the Coyotes got him. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see him playing in the top 12 at some point. He'll definitely get his chance. But again, the big addition, Sam Gagne. As I mentioned before, Gagne had a rough year last year. We all know it. It was the worst year of his career. Uh, he's now 25 years of age, so he's still growing, technically. He's got a couple of years to grow. But he was a sixth overall pick by the Oilers at the 2007 NHL Entry Draft. So this is... a so the 5'11", 202-pound right-handed shooter was expected to start living up to his draft status many years ago. Um, this could be one of, one of the last chances that Sam Gagne could get because if he doesn't break out this year for the Coyotes, then there's going to be an issue. He's naturally a center. He's naturally a center. But the funny thing is, is that he's not very good in, at face-offs. So it's very possible that he could move to the right wing side for the Coyotes this year because of some youngsters coming up that also play the center position. Um, so for Gagne, I, I w I'm sure he'll play center at some point, maybe even play center at the beginning of the year, but I don't see him staying there. And... Um, it, it, it's probably he's probably not going to stay there because he's not good at winning faceoffs, and he can't. And it's proven that he cannot handle the defensive responsibilities of the position either. <coughs> Maybe a move to right wing <coughs> will benefit him. And he's looking at Arizona as a fresh new start <coughs> for his career. I think it can be also. You know, re say what you will about him and look at his statistics, <coughs> but. You can't deny the fact that he's got great hands and skates very well and passes the puck well. More of a playmaker than a goal scorer. And, not to mention, he still holds the best single-game performance in the modern NHL when he had four goals and four assists for a combined eight points in one home game for the Oilers in an eventual 8-4 to four victory against the Chicago Blackhawks. So he, he figured in in all eight goals. Um, that was the best single-game performance of the modern era. That's more points than, Al, than players like Alex Ovechkin or Sidney Crosby or Steven Stamkos ever had in one game. So he should be very proud of himself to still hold that mark. But, you know, it does, but you can't judge a player by just one game. You have to go by um, every game, and that play. But obviously, the player that the Coyotes saw that night, that one game, and even the following game where he had another multi-point performance, 
for that two game stretch, they're hoping to see that Sam Gagne when they when he comes over looking for a brand new start and hopefully moves to the wing. Um, because if he if he does finally start living up to his sixth overall draft status, this is going to be a very good player for them, and he'll help round out their top six. So, I'm actually I actually like the acquisition of him. I think the Coyotes did a good thing, but on the Lightning's end of it, a trade that was very poorly handled because the Coyotes got two really good players um, at, who played the game differently. And the Lightning just get a six-round pick. So those were all of the additions for the Phoenix Coyotes this year and all, all the subtractions. As we now take a look at some of the big questions in the desert this year. And probably the biggest question of all, will the Coyotes rediscover their defensive posture? As I mentioned before, they allowed too many goals last season at 2.76 per game and too many shots. Exactly 31% per game. And their exact 79% penalty kill was 26th in the NHL. Um, Mike Smith is a good goaltender, but he needs help up front. He's not one of those goaltenders that can do it all by himself. Not like, Hen not like Henrik Lundqvist or Jonathan Quick or Pekka Rinne. He's nowhere near as good as those goaltenders. Last year through 62 games, 27 wins. 21 losses and 10 overtime losses for three shutouts, a 264 goals against average, and 915 save percentage. So he had a much better year last year than the lockout Jordan year, that's for sure. But obviously last year, he's, Mike Smith did suffer a season-ending injury on March 24th uh, uh, on the road against the New York Rangers, which actually cost the Coyotes that game. And that actually was probably what cost the Coyotes their season as well. Because despite the fact that Thomas Grice was one of the better backup goalies in the league, he had to play the role of starter when Mike Smith missed the rest of the year, and he's not a starting goaltender. So, um, so um, that, that was a big hole for the Coyotes to fill, but it also comes down to the defense. They had a lot of injuries last year. Um, Zabinik McCulloch missed 22 games last season with a lower body injury. Um, and that was a big blow to their defense as well. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully their defense can get back in shape. And we'll talk about more about their defense core later. Can Arizona's power play prowess survive a busy offseason? Um, again, the Coyotes finished fourth in the NHL at 19.9% on the power play and tied for fourth with 56 goals on the power play. <clears throat> Again, but the big problem now is that they enter the season missing 27% of that production <clears throat> in the form of the de departed forwards <clears throat> Radim Verbata, who had 10 goals on the power play and Mike Ribeiro, who had 5 goals on the power play. They were both... <clears throat> Those were their two most effective power play players, and now they're both gone. Ribeiro again went to Nashville after being bought out, <coughs> and Verbata went to Vancouver. Um, um, <coughs> although we all know assistant coach Newell Brown is a power play specialist, <coughs> um, they have Oliver Ekman Larson and Keith Yandel at the point. They can both really shoot the puck. Um, you know, Brandon Gormley is going to come up, and he's expected to be good offensively as well as playing a solid defensive game. He could help out. <coughs> Michael Stone can help out as well. They have a lot of guys who defensemen who could play power play minutes. So, um, and of course, Michael Bodker was their leading scorer among forwards who are still with the team this year. Um. Uh, Michael Bodker, actually, Mikhail Bodker, actually had a really good year last year. It was kind of a breakout year for him, for the, the for the 24 year old who turns 25 on December 16th. He was the eighth overall pick by the Yotes in 2008, um, and last year was a breakout year for him. 19 goals, 32 assists, 51 points, 
only 20, 20 penalty minutes and 166 shots on goal while scoring five power play goals. <laughs> Although he was a minus nine last year, which is a career low for him. So <laughs> he's not a defensive player, um, but his offensive numbers should hopefully increase this year from last year. That is the anticipation. <laughs> but with as good as the, their top, you know, in addition to the top six having to be good, the bottom six has to be good as well. And one of the questions is, how much stronger are Arizona's bottom six forwards? <coughs> well, as I said before, <coughs> they added Joe Vitale from the Pittsburgh Penguins and acquired B.J. Crombie from the Tampa Bay Lightning in addition to Sam Gagne in that trade. <coughs> so, um, and Antoine Vermette is entering the final year of his contract. <coughs> so... They're hoping that they're, that these additions can really help out their bottom six. <coughs> Joe Vitale, again, he's a, he's a solid player. They also have Brandon McMillan, who may earn himself a shot. <coughs> um, but in what could be Brandon McMillan's last chance to solidify a roster spot. <coughs> but we'll see. It's going to be the Coyotes are going to be an interesting team to watch this year. Um, well, which of Arizona's young forwards will emerge? <coughs> Again, with Ryan Verbata and Michael Barrow gone, and only Sam Gagne and Martin Erat there to replace them, <coughs> they need, they're going to need production support from their talented group of prospects. <coughs> they have Max Domi coming up this year. <coughs> he was the number 12, he was the 12th overall pick in 2013. <coughs> And they also have guys like Henrik Samuelsson and Lucas Lessio who could battle for roster spots this year as well. Henrik Samuelsson, of course, was the 27th overall pick for them in 2012. So he's a player who could emerge as a good player. Lucas Lessio, former second rounder. So, that, so whichever one of these youngsters make it should help. And can Mike Smith recover his 2011-2012 form? Again, he had a good year last year, definitely a better year than his lockout shortened season. But he, and, but, and last summer, he signed a six-year, $34 million contract extension that now officially begins, that officially began last season. He's now into year two of that contract. He was very good last year, but he knows he can be better. Um, so hopefully that is the case. <coughs> Mike Smith to me, yeah, he's an overrated goaltender at times, I will admit. I think he's very overrated at times, and he can't do everything on his own. He's not one of those goaltenders who will steal a game all by himself on a general basis. He needs the, de the defense to help him out. Um, but... He's very big, and he's got a lot of talent. He really does. He possesses a lot of talent. Can what and his and one thing that is true about him is that he's one of the best, if not the best, puck handling goaltenders in the game today. He handles the puck very, very well. I believe he even scored a goal this year, if I recall. I believe he was credited with a goal this year. Um. I know one of the last couple of years he was credited with a goal. Um, I might have been last year, but um, actually no, I think it was it was this year. Yeah, because it was against the Detroit Red Wings. Yep, it it was an empty net goal that Mike Smith was credited with. So, um, so Mike Smith, you know, he has the potential. He's got a lot of potential. Again, though. He wasn't that good until he arrived to the Coyotes, though. In his tenure with the Dallas Stars and Tampa Bay Lightning, he was always injured, and even when he was healthy, he was never very effective. Um, but once he got to Arizona, Phoenix, when where it was called Phoenix, they were called the Phoenix Coyotes back then, He his first season there, he was one of the best goaltenders in the league, and he was a Vezina Trophy finalist. He's 32 years of age now. He won't be 33 until March 22nd. So he's exiting his prime years now. He's in the final couple years of his prime. 
but he should be okay for the next couple of years. I really think he can get himself back into form. He's going to need to if the Coyotes hope to be a really good get back into the playoffs this year. <coughs> but one of the big questions that I have for the Phoenix or the Arizona Coyotes this year, this is really one of the big questions I have for them. Did they do enough? to replace their losses. <coughs> Again, <laughs> buying out Mike Ribeiro, whether it's compliance buyout or regular buyout, and regardless of his off-ice issues, that's a pretty, that's, that's a pretty big, those are pretty big shoes to fill. Because um, it may not have been his best year last year, but he was still one of their more effective players, <coughs> especially on the power play, and he's a guy who makes everyone around him better. He's got great hands, passes the puck well, and so he really did do some things for the coy good things for the Coyotes last year, even though he only had 15 goals and 47 points and 32 assists. Um, and then he got Radim Verbata, who is just one of the most underrated snipers in the league. That wrist shot of his is among the deadliest in the league. Um... The opening game of the season last year against the New York Rangers, he had a hat trick. Um, I mean, he, he is just one tremendous. He is just one underrated player. He really is, um, and he is a really good player. I think that's a big. That's probably the bigger loss between the Coyotes. That's probably their biggest loss of all. They're gonna miss his twenty goals. I was kind of shocked that the Coyotes didn't retain him even though he is 33 years of age. But, again, he went to the Vancouver Canucks. Um, but those are pretty big shoes for the Coyotes to fill. And Sam Gagne, you know, he's very talented, but he's unproven, as, we've, as we witnessed last year with the Oilers. He had a major setback year. And Martin Erat, he was acquired at the trade deadline last year from the Washington Capitals. <laughs> Was just and even though he did play better when he got to the Coyotes, his overall season last year was just a nightmare beyond nightmares. <coughs> and no, it was an incredibly unlucky season for him as well. <coughs> Through <coughs> combined with the Washington Capitals and Arizona Coyotes last year, <coughs> he played 70 games and only had three goals, 26 assists, and 29 points. He was a plus player. He was a plus five overall, <coughs> which is good news. While only have getting 28 penalty minutes, but he only had 53 shots on goal last year. It was a horrible year <coughs> for for Martin Erat last year, and he is going to be a guy who they're going to look to to really be better this year. They're gonna, one thing they may try this year, he's a right winger. He's one of those guys who plays the off wing. He's naturally a right winger, but he has a left-handed shot. He may move to the left wing for this season. But he's 32 years of age. age. <coughs> the, he is 32 years of age, and he'll be 33 in two days, actually. He'll be 33 on August 29th, which is two days away. So happy early birthday to Martin Erat. Um, go enjoy yourself, uh, go enjoy yourself with just some birthday cake and a bottle of beer. <laughs> um, but, uh, just, ju just a little joke. But, uh, he's a guy who they're going to rely on to be much better this year. Um, and, but that's one of the big questions I have for the Coyotes. Did they do enough to really fill, to really replace their losses and... Did they boost their offense in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> As we now take a look at their projected lineup <coughs> for the coming year, um, for the upcoming season for the Coyotes. Again, that forward group is just so concerning. That is the big weakness for the Coyotes this year. It's definitely not as formidable looking as it was last year when they had when they had signed Mike Ribeiro. <coughs> Um, and they have a lot of veterans up front, too. They have a lot of forwards 
who really aren't getting younger, and that includes their captain, Shane Doan, who's 37 years of age but will be 38 just after the season begins. He'll be 38 on October 10th. <coughs> but despite that, Shane Doan is, a, is one of the better leaders in the National Hockey League. He's a class act guy. <coughs> um, and, again, he was second on the team with 23 goals last year. So he may not be the fifth the 50, 60, 70 point score that he used to be, but he can still play a very effective role and score about 20 to 25 goals and play a hard-nosed style. He's one of those hard-nosed players. He's a workhorse. <coughs> um, he'll do anything to get the puck to his, to him himself or his teammates. He plays the body, He's and he's very strong as well. But he... He is expected to play right wing on the top line with Antoine Vermet as his center and Michael Bodker as his left wing. So Antoine Vermet, who is in his contract year and led the team with 24 goals last year, is expected to center Shane Doan, who is second on the team in 23 goals, and Michael Bodker, who, of all the Coyote forwards that are still with the team, led them with 51 points last year. He tied with Radim Verbata, but Radim Verbata is gone. It was a big year for Michael Bod Mikhail Bodker last year, and the Danish forward is expected to take another huge step this year, and hopefully playing with those two will help him take that next step as well. Uh, on the second line, Max Domi is expected to be ready to play in the National Hockey League this year. He was sent back down to the London Knights of the Ontario Hockey League last year as an 18-year-old. But the son of former NHL enforcer Ty Domi is ready to play in the NHL this year after another spectacular year down in London. And he's a guy who could play center or left wing but he'll be expected to at least start the year at center. With Sam Gagne moving from center to right wing to play right wing on that second line. Because again, as I said before, though he is a natural center, he's not good at winning faceoffs and can't handle the defensive responsibilities of the position. So he may be tested out at right wing this season. And Lori Korpakowski on the left wing side. <coughs> That's kind of where the forward group kind of becomes a little bit concerning <coughs> because Lori Korpakowski is a good player. He's got talent, <coughs> but he's not a top six forward. He is a third line. He's a third liner at best. So <coughs> that is a little bit concerning. <coughs> um, he never really lived up to his draft status. He was a former 19th overall pick <coughs> by the New York Rangers in 2004. <coughs> He's now 28 years of age, and the native of Turku, Finland, last year, <coughs> through 64 games played, had 9 goals, 16 assists, 25 points, a minus 7 rating, <coughs> 24 shots on goal, uh, excuse me, 24 penalty minutes, and 109 shots on goal. So, <coughs> last year <coughs> was another rough year for him. <coughs> he also had a rough year in the lockout shortened year. <coughs> He has not been the same player we saw in 2010-11 or 2011-12. Um, he is not a top six forward, but he's projected to play on the top six, and that is concerning. On the third line, I actually like their third line, though. They have Martin Hansel centering David Moss on the right side and Martin Erat on the left side. Again, Martin Erat is a guy who has played right wing throughout his entire career, but is a left-handed shot and could move to the left wing side this season. Probably will move, be tested out on the left wing side this season. Martin Hansel, David Moss, he comes up clutch. He's a clutch player. Um, he'll come up big occasionally. And Martin Hansel, he is just a workhorse. Um, the former 17th overall pick by the Yotes in 2005. He's 27 years of age. Will be 28 in February, so he's officially in the prime of his career now. Hulk's at a huge six foot six, 230 pounds, a left-handed shot, and yet for his huge height, he can actually skate very, very well. He's a very good skater. He's made her fast on his skates, 
And last year <laughs> was Martin Hansel's best year offensively. He had 15, through 65 games last year, 15 goals, <clears throat> 25 assists, and a career-high 40 points. Though he was a career-low, minus 9. He had 73 penalty minutes and 169 shots on goal, which is a career-high. So, though it was his worst year defensively, it was his best year offensively. And they're hoping that maybe he can improve on those numbers and be better defensively this year. <laughs> Um, again, he never really lived up to his 17th overall draft status, but he's still a very good player, and he's just a workhorse. He <coughs> does some really good things out there. I like Martin Hansel, and I like what he brings to the table. And then the fourth line, <coughs> this is where it gets interesting. <coughs> they have Joe Vitale centering Kyle Chipchura on the right side and Brandon McMillan on the left side <coughs> with Rob Klinkhammer and B.J. Crombeam as the 13th and 14th forwards. Rob Klinkhammer actually had a really good year last year. He played a full year last year. Um, he played 72 games last year. <coughs> and he actually led their team in plus-minus last year with a plus-six rating. And he had 11 goals, 9 assists, and 20 points. <coughs> Only 19 penalty minutes and 103 shots on goal. All career highs. I mean, he is 28 years old, obviously, but he's a big player. But the undrafted forward is 6'3", 220 pounds. <coughs> Got a big, big slap shot. <coughs> you know, he may not be an offensive player, but he does have a big slap shot. That can't be denied. <coughs> um, and, you know... <coughs> Um, he does some really good. Th he did some really good things last year. I'm kind of surprised he's not on the main roster. I think the reason he and Crombie aren't on the main roster is because Brandon McMillan. They want to give him one more chance to try to prove himself <coughs> and become a solidified NHL roster player. Um, he's a center who also plays left wing. <coughs> he's 24 years of age. <coughs> But he really needs to prove himself this year. He has the talent to prove himself, <coughs> though. He had a great rookie season with the Anaheim Ducks, but ever since his 2010-2011 rookie season, he has not been the same. <coughs> and it's a real big shame because he's got the talent, he has the speed, well, he's a very good skater, very fast skater, but it just hasn't all come together for him yet, <coughs> which is a big surprise. Um, but he needs to prove himself this year because if not, <coughs> if not, his, his days, at least in Arizona, will come, will be over. <coughs> and then Kyle Chipchura, you know, <coughs> Kyle Chipchura has been an okay player since coming over to the Coyotes. Last year, though, was his best year. <coughs> Through 80, he played a career-high 80 games <coughs> last year and had 5 goals, 15 assists, <coughs> and 20 points. The, the assists and points are career highs. A career high plus 3 rating. Um, 45 penalty minutes and 46 shots on goal. So he was good last year, but at the same time, you know, he's projected to play right wing, but, he can, but he's really a left-handed shot, and he's more of a center than a winger. So, I think this is going to be a, a, also a big year for Kyle Ch Chipchura. I personally would put BJ Crombie and Rob Klinkhammer in <coughs> over Kyle Chipchura <coughs> and Brandon McMillan. That's what I personally would do. I mean, those two guys, though, Joe Vitale, he is the solidified player on that fourth line. He is going to play every game unless he gets hurt. <coughs> but, um, you know... At least that's what I think. I mean, another option, obviously, is to move Chip Chura to center and put a guy like Crombie in the lineup, or move McMillan to center and move and put Klinkhammer in the lineup. Or Klinkhammer can also play center, too, so put him in the lineup straight up, you know, and take Vitali out. You know, they have a lot of options for their fourth line this year. As far as what the fourth line looks like as a whole with these five players... It's a good-looking fourth line, and it's a good situation to be in. But, again, that forward group is just so concerning for the 
for the Coyotes. They are not going to win games through their offense this year unless Max Domi has the rookie year of the century, <coughs> you know, and Sam Gagne breaks out in a tremendous way. Unless something like that happens, then <coughs> their offense is not going to be good this year. It will be one of the worst in the NHL this year. It's going to be one of the worst in the NHL this year regardless. There's no question about that. Um, you know, Antoine, I don't really... But the weakest part of their forward group is their center depth. Antoine Vermette's really not a top-line center. He's a very good player, and he's got a tremendous amount of talent. And in a way, it plays a similar style to that of Patrice Bergeron. He's, not, he's nowhere near as good as Patrice Bergeron, but... He plays that similar style, and he's but and he's older than Patrice Bergeron. He plays a similar style. <coughs> um, so that forward group, obviously, though, they also have forwards like Henrik Samuelsson and Lucas Lesio, who could also battle for spots this year. Those are two highly touted prospects <coughs> um, who are both going to battle for spots this year. Lucas Lesio was their second round 56th overall pick in 2011. He's 21. He got into three games last year. Didn't do much in those three games. It was a minus two. So, but he could earn a roster spot full-time this year. I mean, it's, it's projected that he gets has to play another year down in Portland. But we'll see. We will see. Henrik Samuelsson... You know, he's more likely to me, even though he's also projected to play another year down in the American, to play one year in the American Hockey League, <clears throat> he, to me, would be more likely to get a roster spot out of training camp. They're both going to go to camp with the chance to prove themselves. <clears throat> Whether they actually do prove themselves or not remains to be seen. <clears throat> so, yes, that forward group is very, very concerning. <clears throat> now, on defense, however, complete opposite. This is the biggest strength of their team. Despite how bad they were defensively last year, <coughs> you know, despite how bad they were defensively last year, there's no denying that they are one of the best defense groups in the National Hockey League. They scrapped off the pieces of their defense that were holding them back. Derek Morris was a guy who was really holding them back last year. <coughs> um, and now, with, with him gone, there's room on defense to grow. And last year, their defense, one of the best, one of the tops, I believe, may have been the top scoring defense in the National Hockey League last year. Oliver ekman Lars, we got Oliver for the top pair. For the top pair, we have projected for the top pair, Zabinik McCulloch, who's expected to return who's expected to be 100% this year, and Oliver ekman Larson. Zabinik McCulloch, obviously, he's the older brother of Ottawa Senators forward Milan McCulloch, who re-signed with the Senators this offseason. Um, but he's a shutdown defenseman, um, and he plays big. He, play he's a he plays big. He really does. He's now 31. He'll be 32 December 23rd. But the Czech native um, can play a really big. Um, and he actually was also tied with Rob Klinkhammer for a team leading plus six last year. Um, while only having two goals, eight assists, and ten points. But again, he's a shutdown defenseman. He's been really good with the Coyotes ever since his return to the Coyotes. He had left the Coyotes to play for the Pittsburgh Penguins for a little while. But he is a force on that blue line. He'll stand you up. He's not a guy who messes around. <clears throat> and then Oliver ekman Larson. this guy is just a flat-out beast, and he's only 23 years of age. He was the sixth overall pick in 2009. <clears throat> he's only 23, and last year he set career highs with 15 goals, 29 assists, and 44 games, the 44 points through 80 games played. <clears throat> A career high 199 shots on goal, but he also had a career high 50 50 penalty minutes. The one downside though last year was that he was a minus four, which is a career low for him. So he wasn't that good defensively last year. 
But then again, really none of the Coyotes team was last year. But he is expected to be a good defensive defenseman in the future. <coughs> and <coughs> offensively, he was just a beast last year. He's only going to get better. So he's still really young. He has just proven to be a really good player for them. <coughs> and it's going to be a very soon. He will probably be the anchor man on their blue line this year. He will be expected to be their best defenseman this year. Um, but he was just so good last year. <coughs> He's expected to be even better this year. Now you got the second defense pair. and Projected to play the second defense pair, Keith Yandel and Michael Stone. Keith Yandel, as we know, obviously, Keith Yandel, it was kind of a tale of two seasons for Keith Yandel last year. <coughs> he has been a, a guy who's He's been a centerpiece of trade talks for many years now. So him being traded at some point is still not out of the question. But last year, he played a full 82-game season, had 63 penalty minutes, and had 241 shots on goal. Last year, he not only led the Coyotes' blue line in point scoring and assists, but he led the entire team in point scoring and assists. He only had eight goals last year. <coughs> But he had a team leading 45 assists and a team leading 53 points. So he was their best, not just defenseman, but player offensively. But he was their worst player defensively. He was a minus 23 last year, which was the worst on the team. So he can still be an effective player. I mean, he's generally not a minus player, but that minus 23 really set him back. He's now a minus 2 for his career. But he's looking to have a comeback year this year defensively. <coughs> I mean, he'll look to keep the pace offensively as well as have a better year defensively. You know, he's now 27 years of age. He'll be 28 on September 9th. So his birthday is actually coming up real soon. He's in the prime of his career. <coughs> the Boston, Massachusetts native <coughs> will look to have a much better year this year. And then, of course, you got Michael Stone playing the right side. <coughs> Michael Stone... <coughs> He's only 24, so he's still really young. <coughs> but last year was a breakout year <coughs> for Michael Stone. I mean, he was a minus 10, <coughs> so he was very bad defensively last year, as the rest of the team was. <coughs> but he had 8 goals, 13 assists, and 21 points, 38 penalty minutes, and 105 shots in goal. He gets his shots through, got a big shot from the point. <coughs> Uh, but it really is projected to be more of a defensive defenseman. So he'll look to improve on those on that minus 10 from last year. He'll, look, he'll really look to improve on those numbers. Um, where Keith Yandel is expected to be the offensive threat, Michael Stone will probably be the defensive threat while putting up some significant numbers. I like that defense pair as well. And then Brandon, and then the third pair, they have Brandon Gormley, who's ready, to, who's ready to play in the NHL this year. He got into five games at the end of last year and was really good defensively in those five games. He didn't put up any points, but he was a plus four while only obtaining two, one penalty and only having, but he only had four shots on goal. But, and three of them came in one game. But he showed a lot of promise last year. He's ready to play in the National Hockey League. He was the 13th overall pick <coughs> in 2010, right behind Cam Fowler. We're remembering when both of those defensemen slipped way past where they were expected to be drafted. Those were both defensemen expected to be picked <coughs> in the top five. Cam Fowler slipped, slipped to 12th overall, got selected by the Anaheim Ducks, <coughs> and Brandon Gormley slipped one spot behind him to 13th overall and got selected by the Coyotes. So, <coughs> Gormley, obviously, it did take longer than anticipated for him to be ready to play at the NHL level. He was really expected to be ready to play, really, as a 20-year-old, so it took him a, another couple extra years, <coughs> but he is ready to play now. And then he has David, Sh and then David Schlemko <coughs> is expected to be his defense partner with Chris Summers as a good seventh option. <coughs> Um, last year, last year for David Schlemko, he is more of a shutdown defenseman, flat out. He played 48 games last year and had a goal, 8 assists, and 9 points, but he was a plus 2. 
He had 18 penalty minutes and 61 shots on goal. And Chris Summers, the former 29th overall pick from the 2006 NHL draft, 26 years of age. He'll be 27 <coughs> on February 5th. Um, so he'll enter his prime half, midway, halfway through the year. He played 18 games last year and had two goals, one assist, three points. He was an even. He was even in plus minus. Uh, 15 penalty minutes and 17 shots on goal. He played most of the end of last season, native of Ann Arbor, Michigan. But both he and David Schlemko are shut down defensemen. So either A, Schlemko plays a full season this year for the first time in his career, or Chris Summers takes that spot. <coughs> um, it's going to be a battle between both of them in training camp to be see who becomes the sixth guy. Because Brandon Gormley... There's no doubt that he's ready to play. But then they also have further competition in another former first-round pick, Connor Murphy. Connor Murphy... You know, Con Connor Murphy was the... was a first-round pick back in 2011. Um, um, he could be ready to play this year, and so could defenseman Andrew Campbell. Um, who was a third round 74th overall pick by the Los Angeles Kings in 2008, <coughs> now with the Coyotes. <coughs> he did play three games last year, but he's 26. He'll be 27 February, but he's going to also battle for a spot um, for this upcoming season. But Connor Murphy would be the more likely option between the two of them. <coughs> um, Connor Murphy was the... Um, 20th overall pick <coughs> back to, in the 2011 NHL entry draft. Um, he's a right-handed shot, big six foot three, 190 pounds, and he did get into 30 games last year for the Coyotes <coughs> and had a goal, seven assists, and eight points. He was a plus five, <coughs> only 10 penalty minutes and 30 shots on goal. He's more of a defensive defenseman, but could also score on occasions. He's, he'll score occasionally, and he'll actually score clutch goals. He'll score clutch points, but he's more of a defensive defenseman. He played more of a shutdown role for Team USA at the 2013 World Junior Championships. The only big concern with Connor Murphy is his ability to stay healthy. This is, def this is a defenseman who, no matter where he goes, with the exception of the World Junior Championships in 2013. No matter where he goes, no matter where he plays, he can never seem to buy a break. He always seems to get injured. He's easily prone to injuries, and that could cost him that sixth and final roster spot. <clears throat> but he's going to compete with the likes of David Schlemko and Chris Summers, as well as Andrew Campbell to a lesser extent for that sixth spot. I personally would like to see Connor Murphy get that spot. But honestly, Regardless of who you put in, minus Andrew Campbell, quite honestly, um, minus him, regardless of who you put in, that defense group is just absolutely sick. It's one, it's one of the best, if not the best, defense cores in the National Hockey League. And that is the big strength for the Coyotes this season. I'm telling you right now, if they're going to win, hope to win games this year and get into the playoffs this year, it's going to have to be through playing good defense. Um, they're going to have to probably go by by maybe one or two goal games, maybe three goals to a to an extent, maybe three goals a game, but that's a stretch. But their best bet is going to be to play more of a defensive, laid back style and stand people stand up the uh, the be uh, the best players on the opposite end in the neutral zone. Maybe get one of the dirty goals here and there, but really play more of a defensive style. That's how the Coyotes are going to be successful this year. Not by rushing up the ice and scoring four or five goals a game, or attempting to score that many goals. He'll be better off score. They'll be better off scoring one or two goals a game, maybe three, um, just for insurance. But after that, their best bet will be to sit back, sit tight, tighten up tighten up the neutral zone, clog up the defensive zone, um, 
and uh, stand people up in the zone, in the neutral zone, and if they get an offensive opportunity, play real good, solid defense. Block shots, do block shots, and help clear the garbage out of the dirty areas. <coughs> and win games that way. That will be the strength of the Coyotes this year. That's how they're going to be successful this year. And then, of course, in goal, <coughs> you got Mike Smith as the starter and Devin Dubnik as the backup goaltender with Mark Vishantine, their first-round pick from their first-round 27th overall pick from 2010 as a good third option. If Devin Dubnik doesn't work out, <coughs> then Mark Vishenton will be a good back backup option. Mark Vishenton is a guy <coughs> who is expected to be a starter in the National Hockey League one day. Whether that's going to come sooner or later remains to be seen. I mean, it all depends on if Dubnik is going to have a be a good backup for to Mike Smith and if Mike Smith is going to be able to get back into the form he was in in 2011-2012 when he was a Vezina Trophy finalist. If neither of them play well, then Dubnik probably goes to the minors and Mike Smith goes back to being a backup goaltender and that's when Mark Vicentin will get his opportunity. But he could be ready to be a starter at some point in his career. He will be a starter at some point in his career. Whether that is going to be sooner or later remains to be seen. He will battle Devin Dubnik for the backup job, but Dubnik is at the moment expected to be the guy to get that job. But they're very good in goal, and they're absolutely sick on defense. Their defense is one of the best, if not the best, in the league. That's how they're going to be successful this year. They're, they, I believe their defense had more points than any other defense groups in the National Hockey League. Um, but... The offense, however, is where all the concerns for this team come in. Their offense is not very is not a very good. They do not have a scary offense at all. I mean, it may be an offense that may be able to get a dirty goal here or there, but their offense this year is going to be one of the worst in the league. I'm guaranteeing that you that much. They're going to win games through defense and good penalty killing. As we now go and take a look at the Coyotes' top 10 prospects. I like this pool. I really do. <coughs> I think it's a very good prospect pool. <coughs> it's not as good as the Calgary Flames, and it's probably in combat with that of the Vancouver Canucks. I'd say <coughs> the Canucks' prospect pool may be just a tiny bit better, but it's definitely much better than that of the Edmonton Oilers. <coughs> and it's a very unique one as well because... <coughs> Among all these prospects, they have so many prospects in this pool that are sons of former NHL players. Not all of them are in the top ten, but they have Max Domi, who is the son of Ty Domi. Henrik Samuelson, who is the son, well, the second son of Ulf Samuelson. <coughs> Ryan McInnes, the son of Al McInnes. <coughs> Brendan Perlini, the son of Fred Perlini. Brendan Perlini was their first round pick in this year's draft at number 12th overall. <coughs> Defenseman Connor Murphy, who is the son of Gord Murphy, and goaltender <coughs> Brendan Burke, who is the son of Sean Burke. And as if that weren't enough, the organization also invited unsigned right winger Jackson Playfair to development camp in July, and he is the son of former NHLer Jim Playfair. <coughs> so it's a very interesting group for sure. Again, not all of them are in the top 10, but Ty Domi is their number one prospect, and there's no question about it. There's no argument there. He's ready to play in the NHL as a 19-year-old this year. <coughs> Last year for the London Knights, 61 games played, 34 goals, 59 assists, 93 points. He can play center or left wing. <coughs> We'll probably at least start the year at center for the Coyotes this year, but he, even, but the five foot nine, one hundred ninety seven pound forward is going to be absolutely sick. A much different player from what his father was. His father obviously was more of an enforcer, 
Um, they also have Brandon Gormley as their number two. He's ready to play this year after a good year with the Portland Pirates of the American Hockey League last year. Seven goals, <coughs> 29 assists, and 36 points through 54 games. Six foot two, 196 pounds, a left-handed shot. <coughs> he was an alternate captain for the Pirates last year and in his second season in the AHL. And he just skates so well. He can skate well, moves the puck well, possesses a big shot from the point, but loves to play, but likes to play more of a defensive game. He, more of a defensive defenseman, really a two-way defenseman in the sense that he'll play more of a defensive style, but will get points every now and then. Um, Brendan Perlini, again, their 12th overall pick from this past year, born in the United Kingdom, but raised in Canada. Um, he is, um, I believe he is also the brother of former Anaheim Ducks late rounder, Brett Perlini. Um, he is their number three prospect. He's a project that's probably three years in the making, <coughs> even though he threw 58 games last year with the Niagara Ice Dogs <coughs> of the Ontario Hockey League. He had 34 goals, 37 assists, and 71 points. He was very good. <coughs> For them, and he's got great size, six foot three, two hundred five pounds. And then beyond that, another first rounder, Henrik Samuelson, their twenty seventh overall pick from two thousand twelve, six foot three, two hundred sixteen pounds. He he is not projected to play for another year, but he will battle for a spot at training camp this year. And then beyond that, Tyler Gaudet is number five. Tobias Reeder, the German forward, number six. Lucas Lessio, number seven, <coughs> he'll battle for a spot this year, but is projected to not be ready till next year. Lark Dauphin, um, he's three years away. Ryan K McKinnis, three years away. And Anton Carlson, a very talented prospect who's number 10, he's also three years away. So they have a lot of guys who aren't ready to play just yet. They have a lot of guys who are going to have long waits before they're ready to play. But regardless, I don't judge it by projected NHL arrival. I judge it by overall statistics and just by who the player is. And the Coyotes, um, if I'm a, f a Coyotes fan, I love what they've been able to build over the past few years. Um, their prospect pool is absolutely loaded. And again, Max Domi and Brandon Gormley are two guys are who are going to get every chance to play in the NHL this year. But of all these prospects, honestly, the prospect <laughs> that I've always been very fascinated with, if to be quite honest, I mean, obviously there's no denying Max Domi or Brandon Gormley at number one and number two. But in my personal opinion, <coughs> the prospect that has always highlighted <coughs> my mind without a doubt, has to be their number four prospect center, Henrik Samuelson, the second son to former NHL defenseman Ulf Samuelson, his brother Philip, one of the top prospects for the Pittsburgh Penguins, <coughs> native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, <coughs> yeah, native, native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, has played his hockey... He has played all over the world. He is the 27th overall pick of 2012. Six foot three, 216 pounds, a right-handed shot. <coughs> he had the most points of any of these pros top 10 prospects for the Coyotes last year. Through 65 games played, <coughs> 35 goals, 60 assists, and 95 points while serving as an alternate captain for for the Edmonton Oil Kings of the Western Hockey League. He led them in scoring last year <coughs> en route to winning the Memorial Cup. Through he also he also had eight goals and twenty three points and fifty one penalty minutes in twenty one WHL playoff games and then led the Memorial Cup in scoring with eight points in five games. That's just absolutely remarkable. He also plays with a little bit of grit, just like his father used to. Um, and he is a player who, at 20 years of age, just does a little bit of everything, and he's been all over the world. He's played for the U.S. National Team Development Program 
in the United States Hockey League, the under-17s and the under-18s, all in one year. <coughs> He's played <coughs> for Moto Hockey, Orns, Orns Coldsvik. He played for their under-18 program, and he also played for their junior team in the Swedish Junior League. Um, and he also played for their professional team in the Swedish Hockey League. He pl spent, spent some time in the Swedish Hockey League and then ultimately ended up <coughs> with the Edmonton Oil Kings of the Western Hockey League. So he's been in the United States, <coughs> he's been in Sweden, and he's been in Canada. This is a guy who has experience <coughs> playing around the world, which is just a great aspect to have. <coughs> it really is. <coughs> um, so, you know, again, he's probably another year away <coughs> He's probably another year away, but at the very least, he will go into camp this year. He probably won't make it this year, but by 2015, 2016, when he's 21 years of age and a little more experienced, by then, he will definitely be ready. What if he's not ready this year? I mean, his birthday is February 7th. He'll be 21 in February. So, Henrik Samuelsson is my top prospect for the Arizona Coyotes. He is the prospect that impresses me their most. He is their he's the he's a center and he's their number 4 prospect, but he is my personal number 1. <coughs> now, the player on the Arizona Coyotes who has to be better this year in order for the Coyotes to be a playoff team. <coughs> for the Coyotes, one could argue and say that there's a lot of players that need to be better, including Sam Gagne who they acquired from the Tampa Bay Lightning in the three-way trade. Obviously, he had his worst year last year with the Edmonton Oilers and was a minus 29. That's, a, that's pretty bad. It really is. Believe me, Sam Gagne is definitely a player who needs to be better. However, there was one player, at least, who was worse than him last year, and that player is my player who has to be better for the Coyotes. It was actually a pretty easy choice for the Coyotes as far as who I think who has to be better. But the player for the Coyotes this year who has to be better in order for the Coyotes to be a possible playoff team without a doubt has to be forward Martin Erat. And there's no doubt about it. Martin Erat last year split the year between the Washington Capitals and the Arizona Coyotes was dealt to the Yotes at the deadline. Um, now, the one positive about Martin Erat last year was that he was a plus player. He was a plus one for the Caps and a plus four for the Yotes. He played much better when he got to the Yotes, especially defensively. But offensively last year, he was just horrendous. <coughs> um, for the two teams combined, one goal with the Capitals, two goals with the Coyotes... So three goals overall through 53 games with the Caps, 17 with the Yotes, that's 70 games overall, 23 assists with the Caps, 3 assists with the Yotes, 26 assists overall, 24 points, 5 point for the Caps, 5 for the Yotes, 29 points overall, <coughs> 22 penalty minutes for the Caps, 6 for the Yotes, that's 28 penalty minutes overall, so the good news is he stayed out of the box. 40, only 46 shots on goals for the Caps and 7 for the Oats. That's 53 shots on goal total. And he's usually a guy who who will sh put many more shots on goal than that. Through a full season, he's usually a guy who puts up at least 107 shots on goal a year. <coughs> um, but last year, just even though he was a plus player, that was his only upside from last year. Everywhere else... And the fact that he didn't have many penalty minutes. Everywhere else, he was just horrible. He's an offensive player. He's considered an offensive player, and he didn't look like one last year. He, And yet, he still somehow managed to represent Team Czech Republic at the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia. Even though he did have a goal in that tournament, I still question to this day why he even was there in the first place. He definitely did not deserve to be there. There was poor management by the Czech Republic staff, uh, general managing staff. They actually 
left out a lot of players who should have been there and put in a lot of players who should not have been there, and Martin Erat was one of them. <coughs> Last year, he was just absolutely atrocious <coughs> combined with the Capitals and the Yotes. Um, now, some will tell you that he did do good things and that he was just terribly unlucky, but there's no excuse for that. This is a guy who's been a rather consistent player throughout his entire career when he was with the Nashville Predators. He was always a consistent player for them. <coughs> I mean... <coughs> Now, okay, he really wasn't that good in the lockout short year, I will admit. But prior to that, he was always one of the more consistent performers for the Na Nashville Predators. And he, in 2011-12, he set a career high in points. He had 58 points that year. Um, and also was decent in the playoffs that year. Um, it was ultimately the Yotes that beat them in the playoffs in the second round that year, but still... But, man, Martin Erat last year was just so bad. You know, now, obviously, throughout his whole career, he's been a right wing while possessing a left-handed shot. He's 32 years of age. He'll be, again, 33 in two days. Once again, happy birthday. Former 7th round, 191st overall pick by the Nashville Predators in 1999. A very bad draft year where he was one of the few upsides from a very bad draft class. <coughs> 6 foot, 196 pounds. Um, this year, at least to begin the year, it'll, he'll be experimented on the left wing side. And I hope, Mar and if I'm the Coyotes, I'm really hoping that he does get himself back in shape and has a good year. Because he's projected to play on the third line with Martin Hansel and David Moss. When clearly, Lori Korpakoski, who's projected to play on the second line with Max Domi and Sam Gagne, should be the guy playing on the third line. Which is why, if I'm the Coyotes, I'm really hoping Martin Erat turns it around this year. Because if he does, then there's going to be no hesitation to move him up to the second line and put him back in a top six role. <coughs> where he belongs, and put Lori Korpakoski on the third line where he really belongs. Because right now, that part of their offense is a big mess. Um, Korpakoski is not a top six forward. He is a third liner, but he's going to be given top six minutes to start the season. And he had a bad year last year, too. He was another guy who could have been a candidate to be, have a better year, actually. He had even less point... Oh. Um... Actually, he had less points than um, uh, Martin Erat last year. But they are the reason that Erat was the player who has to be better, not Korpakoski, is because they're two totally different players. <coughs> Korpakoski is more of a depth type player who <coughs> does possess talent, but really plays more who really plays more of a defensive style. But to me, Martin Erat's more suited for the top six role, but he's projected on the third line. That's how bad he was last year, and that is why Martin Erat is the player who has to be better <coughs> in order for the Coyotes to make the playoffs and not Lori Korpakoski. <coughs> but if Martin Erat can find his game again and maybe develop chemistry with whichever center he's going to play with, whether it's Martin Hansel or Max Domi or even Sam Gagne to a lesser extent, <coughs> then, then the Coyotes will find themselves back in good shape. But if he plays like he did the last couple of years, then they're going to be in trouble. But, but Martin Erat ultimately is the player who has to be better for the Coyotes in order for them to be a playoff team this year. Overall, are the Arizona Coyotes a playoff team this year? Believe it or not, it's a really tough question. The, like the Vancouver Canucks, the Arizona Coyotes are in one of those teams that are a bubble team. They are definitely a bubble team this year. Um, and what part of the bubble will they be in remains to be seen. They'll definitely have a winning record regardless, and they may have a better year than they did last year. Last year they had... And last year they had 89 points, which is pretty good for a team that missed the playoffs. But it's all account of being better from an individual standpoint as well. Hopefully, I personally do believe that with this new defense group set up, they'll be much better 
their plus minus at the they'll have a better plus minus this year, not just as a team, but the individual players. Um and even though that forward group is concerning, that they I do trust Mike Smith in goal. Yes, he's overrated at times, but he is good enough to be a trusted number one, at least until he proves otherwise. But that defense is just absolutely sick. Again, if they're going to make the playoffs, it's going to come through their defense. Their defense is going to have to be the key. They're going to have to, again, I said it earlier, score maybe one, maybe one or two goals a game, maybe three to put the game away. But ultimately, through the rest of the way, clog up the defensive zone, clog up the neutral zone, prevent guys from getting in, and help out Mike Smith a bit. Because if they, Mike Smith's a great, a very good goalie, but he does need help. He's not one of those guys who can do it all on his own, like Henrik Lundqvist or Jonathan Quick or Pekka Rene or Sergei Bobrovsky. He's not like Simeon Varlamov was last year, who pretty much carried the team and was a Vezina Trophy finalist. He is a goaltender that needs help. And if he gets that help, then he'll definitely return to the form he was in in 2011-2012. <clears throat> um, that defense is going to be key for the Coyotes because that defense is just so sick. Again, Zabinik McCulloch, Oliver Ekman Larson, <coughs> Michael Stone, who's only getting better, Keith Yandel, Brandon Gormley's going to be a good player, David Schlemko is good. You know, he's a solid shutdown defenseman. <laughs> Chris Summers is okay. He's a good seventh option. And then Connor Murphy is a good guy who could also be in the lineup. He's going to be a good player, too. He was really good through 30 games last year. <coughs> it's, there's no doubt in my mind that he could do it through a full season as well if he could stay healthy. That's going to be key as well. But um, now... Obviously, that doesn't answer the question whether the Coyotes will make the playoffs or not. I'm about to answer that right now. <clears throat> Again, yes, their forward group looks very discombobulated this year. It's a, one of the weakest, if not the weakest, forward groups in the National Hockey League. But that defense kind of that that defense and their goaltending kind of makes up for it. You know. It's very tough to say because, you know, the Vancouver Canucks, they did a lot this offseason, and the Coyotes really didn't do a lot this offseason. The Canucks were very active, and they could put themselves back in the playoffs this year. I said no to them being in the playoffs this year. Here in my last video, I did the Canucks yesterday, obviously. For them, I said no to being a playoff team just because of teams like the Coyotes and the San Jose Sharks. Well, then when you look at the San Jose Sharks, they were the worst team this year as far as the offseason went. Because Doug Wilson said that this was going to be a big rebuild year for the Sharks and that he was going to get players to complement his team. What did he do? Well, he let go of veteran players, Dan Boyle in particular, and all he brought in was John Scott, who is nothing but size. He's arguably the worst player in the league today. And that, and now with a guy like Brent Burns, who was so good on the offense, being forced to move back to defense this year, that puts the Sharks in a very bad position. It really does. And I'm and with Antti Niemi kind of coming down to earth and not being the same goaltender that he had been in the past. You know, last year was such a bad year for Antti Niemi, particularly in the playoffs. Alex Stalock, he really didn't help that much either. He was good, but not good enough. And I think Mike Smith is a much better goaltender than Antti Niemi is he, at this stage in both of their careers. So, you know, the Sharks really aren't solidified playoff team anymore now when you look at it, even though they have a great center depth and a great one-two punch in Logan Couture and Joe Pavelski, you know, and even Joe Thornton. He's still there, even though they were trying to move him. He's still there. But 
Their defense now is very lackluster, and their goaltending now looks inconsistent, whereas the Coyotes, yeah, their offense is really bad this year, but their defense is one of the best, if not the best in the league, and their goaltending is consistent enough <laughs> with Mike Smith as the starter. So the experts said that they will not make the playoffs, but I'm going to take a gamble here. I'm going to take a major, major gamble here because I do like, and just because of the fact that I do like to choose a, with these one team in each conference that didn't make the playoffs, that will make the playoffs, I'm going to take a major gamble here. I'm going to say yes. I say after two years, the, Fien the Arizona Coyotes in their first year as the Arizona Coyotes and their first year with their arena being called the... Um, being called the Gila River Arena, I am going to say yes to the Arizona Coyotes making the playoffs. I'm taking a major gamble here. I probably should say no to them being a playoff team, but again, I like to choose a different team every year that's going to make the playoffs, and one team that made it last year that won't make it. I say the San Jose Sharks, I mean, I'll obviously... I have the San Jose Sharks in two days, but obviously an early preview to that video that's two days away. I'm going to say they don't make the playoffs, and I'm going to say the Arizona Coyotes take their place. I'm taking a major gamble here. They may not make the playoffs. They may not. And that won't surprise me at all. It really won't. I'm not being true to my word here. I really am not. I'm really optimistic about this decision. But I'm going to take a gamble and say yes to the Coyotes making the playoffs only because of how good their defense is, how good their youngsters are going to be this year, or how good I think they're going to be, and how good Mike Smith is when he's playing at his best. Even Devin Dubnik, I think, yeah, he's definitely not a starter, but he's going to be one of the better backup goaltenders in the league this year. So, yes, even though it is a gamble... I'm going to say yes, the Arizona Coyotes will be back in the playoffs this year. So I'm optimistic about it. I'm not guaranteeing that they're going to make it, but I'm taking a major gamble. Yes, the Arizona Coyotes are a playoff team this year. And that will do it for episode 159 of Hockey on the Spot. Be thank you all for joining me. We are almost done here, folks. Traveling-wise, we only have one more place to go, and that is the state of California. The last three videos are going to be the three California-based teams, and tomorrow's video, we are going to do the defending Stanley Cup champions, the Los Angeles Kings. So be sure to tune in <coughs> for that. Join me again tomorrow when we talk about the defending Stanley Cup champions, the Los Angeles Kings. So until then... This has been Hockey on the Spot with Brandon Barenfeld. I'm Brandon Barenfeld. Thank you all for joining me, and I'll see you all again tomorrow. Thank you all, and have a great day.